Unit 2. Communist and Post-Communist Countries Over the course of the past century, the advanced industrialized democracies, represented by Britain in this book, have become the wealthiest and most powerful countries in the world. However, these countries have been widely criticized for the degree of economic inequality that exists among their citizens, as well as the big divide in wealth and power between them and other countries of the world. Have advanced democracies encouraged and valued freedom at the expense of equality to such a degree that we may see them as basically unjust societies? Communist countries answer this question with a resounding yes, and base their governments on the belief that equality is undervalued in capitalist countries, such as Britain and the United States. During the 20th century, two large countries declared themselves to be communist nations, the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. Together, they were home to a large share of the world's population, and the economic and political influence of communism was indisputable. Today, the Soviet Union has collapsed, leaving in its wake dozens of fledgling democracies, all struggling for their survival. Among major nations, only China remains under communist rule, although Cuba and North Korea are well-known communist regimes as well. Communism has taken many forms since its birth in the mid-19th century. The variations are so vast that they often appear to have little in common, although all claim to have roots in Marxism. Marxism The father of communism is generally acknowledged to be Karl Marx, who first wrote about his interpretation of history and vision for the future in The Communist Manifesto in 1848. He saw capitalism, or the free market, as an economic system that exploited workers and increased the gap between the rich and the poor. He believed that conditions in capitalist countries would eventually become so bad that workers would join together in a revolution of the proletariat, workers, and overcome the bourgeoisie, who were owners of factories and other means of production. Marx envisioned a new world after the revolution, one in which social class would disappear because the ownership of private property would be banned. According to Marx, communism encourages equality and cooperation, and without property to encourage greed and strife, Governments would be unnecessary, and they would wither away. Marxism-Leninism Russia was the first country to base a political system on Marxist theory. The revolution of the proletariat occurred in 1917, but did not follow the steps outlined by Karl Marx. Marx believed that the revolution would first take place in industrialized capitalist countries. Early 20th century Russia had only begun to industrialize by the late 19th century and was far beyond countries like Britain, Germany, and the United States. However, revolutionary leader Vladimir Lenin believed that the dictatorial Tsar should be overthrown and that the Russian peasants should be released from oppression. Lenin changed the nature of communism by asserting the importance of the vanguard of the revolution, a group of revolutionary leaders who could provoke the revolution in non-capitalist Russia. The government he established in 1917 was based on democratic centralism, or the vanguard, who would lead the revolution since the people were incapable of providing leadership themselves. Democratic centralism provided for a hierarchical party structure in which leaders were elected from below. Discussion was permitted by party members until a decision was made, but centralism took over, and the leaders allowed no questioning of the decision after the fact. Lenin proceeded to direct industrialization and agricultural development from a centralized government, and capitalistic ventures were severely restricted in the Soviet Union. The system that Lenin set up has been incredibly influential because all communist countries it followed based their systems on the Soviet model. Political power rests with the Communist Party a relatively small vanguard organization that by its very nature allows no competing ideologies to challenge it. The legitimacy of this state rests squarely on the party as the embodiment of communist ideology. Ironically, this feature of communist systems transform Marxism, with all of its idealistic beliefs in equality for common citizen, into authoritarianism. Communist states are often associated with the use of force, but they also rely on co-optation, or allocation of power through various political, social, and economic institutions. Recruitment of elites takes place through nomenclatura, the process of filling influential jobs in the state, society, or the economy with people approved and chosen by the Communist Party. Nomenclatura includes not only political jobs, but almost all top positions in other areas as well such as university presidents, newspaper editors, and military officers. 
Party approval translates as party membership, so the easiest way for an individual to get ahead is to join the party. Despite the authoritarian nature of communist states, it is also true that the system does allow for a certain amount of social mobility, or the opportunity for individuals to change their social status over the course of their lifetimes. Maoism and Market-Based Socialism China's version of communism began shortly after Lenin's revolution in Russia, but China's government was not controlled by communists until 1949. Almost from the beginning, China's communist leader was Mao Zedong, whose interpretation of Marxism was very different from that of the Soviet leaders. Maoism shares Marx's vision of equality and cooperation, but Mao believed very strongly in preserving China's peasant-based society. Although the government sometimes emphasized industrialization during Mao's long rule, by and large, Mao was interested in promoting a revolutionary fervor that strengthened agriculturally based communities. After Mao's death in 1976, Deng Xiaoping instituted market based socialism, which today allows for a significant infusion of capitalism into the system. China chose a relatively gradual and smooth infusion of capitalism controlled by the government in contrast to the internal upheavals that broke the Soviet Union apart after Mikhail Gorbachev tried to resuscitate the economy during the late 1980s. Russia's rocky road to capitalism continued during the first years of the new regime, as Boris Yeltsin tried to privatize the economy through shock therapy. Gender Relations in Communist Regimes Marxists often see traditional gender relations, with women in subservient roles to men, as resulting from the underlying inequality encouraged by capitalist societies. Men exploit women through the family structure in much the same way that the bourgeoisie exploit the proletariat in the workplace. Communism envisions complete economic, social, and political equality between men and women. As you will see in Russia and China, this ideal was not followed in reality in any of the communist countries. However, it almost certainly increased opportunities for women, so that until the late 20th century, women in communist countries were more likely to work outside the home than women in capitalist countries. Communist Political Economy Communist ideology led to political economies characterized by central planning, in which the ownership of private property and the market mechanisms were replaced with the allocation of resources by the state bureaucracy. According to the basic tenets of Marxism, neither principal, ownership of private property, nor the market economy, encourages equitable distribution of wealth. Countries with communist political economies have experienced these two problems. Logistical difficulties. Planning an entire economy is an extremely difficult task. The larger the economy, the more difficult the planning is, and the less efficient the implementation is. In a market economy, supply and demand interact spontaneously, and active management of an economy takes more work and energy. Lack of worker incentives. Capitalist countries often repeat this criticism of communist political economies. Workers have no fear of losing their jobs, and factories don't worry about going out of business, so there are very few incentives for producing good quality products. In the absence of competition and incentives, innovation and efficiency disappear. And as a result, communist economies generally fall behind market economies. In the case of the USSR, these problems were insurmountable, and they led to the dissolution of the Soviet republics. New Economic Ties Since Russia no longer has official ties to communism, and China has now integrated capitalism into its economic system, just how important theoretical communism is to either country today is in question. New directions are indicated by both countries as they establish their roles in the global marketplace. In 2001, a chief economist of Goldman Sachs first coined the term BRIC for the fast-growing economies of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Goldman Sachs noted that the economies of the four countries are growing so fast that they might overtake the combined economies of the current richest countries of the world by 2050. In June 2009, the leaders of the BRIC countries held their first summit in Yekaterinburg, Russia, where they discussed common concerns and demanded more say in global policymaking. At the time of their meeting, the economies of Brazil, India, and China were recovering from the global monetary crisis of September 2008, but the Russian economy was still plagued by plunging oil prices. Since then, they've met in various cities in the BRIC countries. 
South Africa sought BRIC membership beginning in 2009, and the process for formal admission began in 2010. South Africa was officially admitted as a BRIC nation on December 24, 2010, after being invited by China and other BRIC countries to join the group, altering the acronym to BRICS. South African President Jacob Zuma attended the BRICS summit in Sanya in April 2011 as a full member. Both China and Russia today have authoritarian governments, although Russia, as you will see, set up democratic structures in the Constitution of 1993. Both have integrated capitalism into their economic systems, although they have taken very different paths to reach that end, and both have become important players in international markets. How these economic changes will impact their political systems is an unfolding drama, as both countries test the Western assumption that capitalism and democracy go hand in hand. So far, China and Russia appear to be setting their own rules, and it is far from clear that democratic principles will be a part of their future. In the pages that follow, we will examine in more detail the influence of communism on Russia and China. For Russia, has communism now been successfully replaced with capitalism? In China, has the system strayed so far from Marxism that it can hardly be seen as communism today?